Harrison with another steal, and here come the Bruins the other way. Hazard on the dribble, passes to Goodrich, he scores! And Duke continues to have trouble with that. Goodrich fires from 18, and it's good! At 36 points for the UCLA first half. Now Kendra goes high in the air, notches the rebound away from Don May. And off a pass with Ricky and he's just out into the right of the lane. Puts up another long pass to Essinger, who drops in here. Good away from Lou Alcindor to bow out. This day, the names ring familiar. Walt Hazard, Gail Goodrich, Keith Eriks. The year was 1964, and the Bruins were beating a path toward national acclaim. But coach John Wooden had a situation that did not quite honor the press clippings. We practiced on the third floor of an old gym under conditions that uh, were very, very difficult. For actually, for 17 years, my first uh, job each day at practice with the managers was to sweep and mop the gym floor. Despite the obstacles, by mid-January, UCLA found itself rated number one for the first time in the school's history. They did it with a playmaking wizard that had idolized Marcus Haynes of the Globetrotters and a team that averaged 6'3 in height. Number 42, Walt Hazard, known today as Abdul Rahman Hazard, was one of the flashiest, most precise passers ever to play the game. His style was initially contrary to Wooden's views of basketball, but he soon learned to adjust. I'll never forget we played in the L.A. Classic my sophomore year, and I jumped up in the air and spun around in the air, threw the ball over my shoulder, and the ball went out of bounds. And as I was running back down the floor, I remember looking at the bench, and the coach was running step for step with me. He said, we don't need Hot Rod Hundley. We don't need a globe trotter. If you play like that, you'll be over here. And uh, that kind of stuck with me, you know, because I didn't like to sit next to him on the bench. Hazard, along with assistant Jack Hirsch, the forgotten man on the 64 Bruin team, are currently coaching at Compton College in L.A. and employing the wooden philosophy. And you know what happens when they come in our place? It's going to be hot, right? It's going to be hot. All right, let's work, man. We're going to do it. Wooden left nothing to chance, spending hours in practice drilling fundamental basketball. Fast break, fast break, fast break. You know, you run lane drills all day. And somewhere in the season, at some point, you realize, well, hey, I'm doing this automatically. And then you start feeling your conditioning and you say, man, I mean, nobody's going to outrun us. And then you see this man walking around with his program rolled up, confident, cool, poised. And, you know, we became a bunch of cold killers. Really? Yeah, that's what we, we never went on the court. I never went on the court knowing I was going to lose a game. Never. Yeah. That's what that's, uh, or be afraid by anybody. That cool confidence took UCLA to the final four at Kansas City, where they beat Kansas State by six and prepared to face a taller Duke team in the finals. The Bruins reeled off 16 straight points during the first half. Gail Goodrich's deft outside touch and 27 points, plus Kenny Washington's 26 off the bench, gave UCLA a 98-83 victory, a 30-0 and season, and their first national championship. Said Coach Wooden, now you are champions. You must act like champions. And so they did. 
following year, the Bruins returned only starters Keith Erickson and Gail Goodridge, who would now be called upon as playmaker plus scorer. UCLA took their win streak to Illinois for the season open, but they were demolished by 27 points. It would be one of only two losses they suffered all year. Again, Wooden employed the same high post offense he had used so effectively in 64. With assistant coach Jerry Norman constantly supplying counsel to Wooden, the two continued the full court press that seemed perfectly suited to the talent they had to work with. And they were just admirably uh, qualified to play the press. And then number one position, Goodrich is about as good a player as you could ever have. The number five position, Erickson is the best I've ever seen to play that position. So each player had certain qualifications that made him work well in the particular position that I wanted to use them in the press. Uh, I had used the same pressing defense in uh, in uh, late 1930s and early 1940s when I was coaching in high school. And uh, I read the other day where some coach said that he had uh, he'd used the press uh, in the early 30s and 20s. Well, that, uh, that made me chuckle a little bit, the zone press, because of the fact that the center jump wasn't abolished until 38, and you couldn't very well use zone press before the center jump was abolished because uh, the main strength of the press is uh, setting up after a field goal is made. But when you take uh, the ball back to center jump, why, it's... Uh, it's uh, uh, not likely that you can have a, a very good press. With ease, the number two ranked Bruins coasted to the NCAA Finals where they were pitted against number one Michigan and their consensus All-American, Cassie Russell. Initially, the going was tough until Gail Goodrich took command and scored a career-high 42 points in his last game as a Brewer. That was a great, great night. Um, I don't know, it's, it's hard to say. Um, as I look back, it was probably my greatest individual game. 1965 was a new team. We had lost three starters from the year before, and I think there were very, very few people who thought we could repeat as champions. Towards the end of the game, the last few moments, I came over to Wooden and I said, we did it, we did it. And uh, I think that was just a great thrill that we were able to, to really come back and do something which, again, a lot of people, or most people, most basketball experts didn't think we were able to do. Michigan never got closer than 12 points in the second half. And again, the boys from Westwood were the best team in college basketball. He came in 1966, the most highly recruited player in the nation. Lou Alcindor, now Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, changed college basketball. As early as his first freshman game against the varsity, it was not hard to see that this son of a subway policeman was special. Varsity forward Mike Warren remembers. Everyone knows that the varsity always beat the freshmen. I mean, what, what happened? Well, essentially, they kicked our butts. <laughs> it's very simple. I can remember very vividly at the end of that game, Coach Wooden really didn't know what to say. You know, here we were, preseason favorites to win the whole thing again. And he said, just don't feel too bad because they are the best team in the country. And as he was given this little, little pep talk, the frosh ran by a locker room saying, we're number one, <laughs> we're number one. It was a quite humbling experience, to say the least. In 1966, for the first time in six years, the Bruins watched the NCAA tournament, and it was rumored that freshman Al Cinder was transferring to Michigan. That had to do mainly with the fact that uh, I was very lonely. Uh, playing basketball and going to school was just about all that I had to do. That was when I was a freshman and trying to, trying to deal with the adjustment in, in my life and I guess a lot of culture shock coming here from New York. Al Cinder adjusted and in 1967 at Pauley Pavilion played his first varsity game. Bruin basketball finally had a hold. And Al Cinder, Allen, Shackleford, Heights, and Warren became the youngest team to ever win a national championship. 
they strung together 47 victories until one fateful night against Houston in 1968. I think in the Astrodome was a, a tremendous game. I didn't want to play in the Astrodome to begin with. I didn't think it was uh, cut out for basketball. I still feel the same way. I think it's a poor place to play basketball. With a background, didn't like it. I didn't think any uh, player could possibly shoot well because of the background and everything. I was wrong because Hayes shot tremendously well. Hayes had uh, one of the great individual uh, performances that I've seen the player have. Before 52,000 spectators, Elvin Hayes scored 39 points, while Al Cinder struggled with an eye injury and shot just four for 18 from the field. With the game tied in the final minute, Lynn Shackelford fouled Hayes, and his two free throws gave Houston an upset victory before the hometown crowd. From that moment, the Bruins geared their season to the playoffs. The great rematch with Houston took place in the NCAA semifinals, but the game took on the look of a great mismatch. With the help of assistant Jerry Norman, John Wooden decided to guard Hayes differently. I kept Al Cinder underneath the basket all the time. Mike Warren, the shortest man out front, and I put uh, Shackelford uh, on uh, Hayes just to play him tight and not think about any defense except Hayes, try to keep him having the ball. The strategy worked, and the Big E was held to about 10 points, while UCLA built as much as a 44-point lead in the second half. The team played a tremendous uh, basketball game. I may be a point or so off, but I think if you look up the scorebook, you'd find that all starters uh, scored, say, from 15 to 19 points. Everyone had a fine ball game, and I think it was one of the finest collegiate played uh, basketball uh, games, certainly by one team that I have ever seen. Playing on the same floor as was used in the Astrodome game, the Bruins coasted to an easy 101-69 victory. Houston coach Guy Lewis called it the greatest exhibition of basketball I have ever seen. Now, only one obstacle lay in John Wooden's quest for a fourth title. Dean Smith and his North Carolina Tar Heels. In the finals, North Carolina tried a slowdown game. But the Bruins filled it lob passes into Al Cinder, who connected for 34 points en route to a 78-55 victory. At the time, it was the largest winning margin ever in an NCAA title game. Next year, in 1969, UCLA repeated as national champions, beating Purdue. With five titles to his credit, Wooden surpassed Adolph Rupp of Kentucky, and Al Cinder became the Bruins' top career scorer with over 2,300 points. UCLA had won 88 of 90 games during the Al Cinder era. Wooden called them the team without because for the first time in three seasons, they lacked a seven-foot dominator who could carry the load. In fact, no one expected the Bruins to defend their NCAA crown. But in stepped a 6'8 junior power forward named Sidney Wicks, who methodically controlled the boards and initiated a furious fast break. Steve Patterson and Curtis Rowe formed one of the most physical front lines ever seen in Westwood. But according to Coach Wooden, Wicks was the player that thrived on the pressure. Sidney was a tremendous performer for us, a highly spirited player. He's uh, taken a bad rap in some ways, I feel, as a pro. I've heard those say that he wasn't a competitor. I consider Sidney to be one of the finest competitors I ever coached. He's the one that wanted to take the shot in the clutch situation. He'd get you the tough rebound in the clutch situation. He'd block the shot in a tough situation. I considered him a great competitor. Uh -huh. 
UCLA came into the 1970 NCAA Finals with only two losses. But one question remained. Could the Shota Bruin stop Jacksonville's seven-foot, two-inch center? His name, Artis Gilmore, and he cut through the Bruin defense at will until Wicks decided to front him. We were down well in the beginning of the game, and then we made a little change defensively, and he's the one that wanted to play Gilmore differently than the way I thought Gilmore should be played. And I decided to do it because I know that Sidney's great desire will help him show me that he knew what was best. And all I was interested in is what was best. Wicks blocked five of Gilmore's shots in the first half alone. And his devastating defensive play, along with Patterson and Rose, 19 points each, gave the Bruins their fourth straight title. One year later, with four starters back from the previous season, UCLA defeated Villanova in the finals. At age 60, John Wooden had his seventh NCAA title and a phenomenal fifth in a row. 1972 marked the highest scoring team in Bruin history and a squad that beat opponents by a major college record of 30 points per game. John Wooden had created a pulverizing basketball machine, but certainly not by conventional methods. First of all, he would never tell us about the other team. You know, we, we, we never know who was on the other team, you know. It's like if they had a big man or guards or anything like that. You know, we had to read the paper to find out who we were playing against, basically. He only concentrated on what we were going to do. And then right at the last 10 seconds of every speech, he would say, it's not important to me, boys, if you win or lose this game. What's important to me is that you can walk out of here with your heads up. And he'd be pointing his program at us, you know, and he'd say, you know, the most important thing is to know you did your best at the end of every game. And that's what I want tonight. And then we go crazy and run out there and, you know, win by 50 points. <laughs> the outspoken and politically active Walton was the spearhead of this young collection, and the fast break became their trademark. UCLA's current assistant coach, Larry Farmer, played with the Bruins' all-time rebounder, and he still remembers the pleasures. Bill made it very easy. Uh, on the defensive end, we funneled everybody toward Bill. I knew that on the boards, all I had to do was box my man out to keep him away from Bill, and Bill would get every rebound. Offensively, he made everything happen for everybody. If he was actively involved in the offense, just being on the court, making his presence felt, it made everybody uh, that much better. It made it easier for us to all get the ball and, and have some fun with it. When Pax was over, I wondered about Bill, whether he might be uh, protesting the Vietnam War and he might be down in the West L.A. jail or he might be taking over the administration building or he might be lying down on Wilshire Boulevard, all of those things which happened to him at one time or another because he's trying to express his views. The views of their devotees were evident as UCLA sought their sixth consecutive championship. This one against Florida State in the NCAA Finals at their old stomping ground, the Sports Arena in Los Angeles. Walton, Wilkes, Lee, Farmer, and Bibby had defeated Denny Crum's Louisville team in the semis. Ironic because while an assistant at UCLA, Crum had recruited Walton and Wilkes. Against Florida State, Walton scored 24. And Henry Bibby, the lone senior starter on the team, scored 18. Though the Bruins would defeat the Seminoles this day, it would prove their closest contest of the 10 championship victories during the dynasty. However, this game's glory belonged to Silky Jamal Wilkes, then known as Keith, whose 23 points pushed the Bruins over the top. What I remember about the game is you know, we were very nervous. It was in the sports arena, and Bill Walton, as usual, created a lot of problems inside, which allowed me to get open shots or get my man one-on-one, -on -one, and it was just an incredible afternoon. The 81-76 win gave the Bruins six championships in a row and eight overall. Word began to spread among the coaches that UCLA's dominance was hurting the game. That dominance continued as the Walton gang entered their second NCAA championship game undefeated. 
on the line a winning streak of 74 games that had eclipsed San Francisco's record of 60 straight. Memphis State fell victim this time to one of the greatest tournament scoring games ever. Bill Walton scored 44 points and shot an amazing 21 for 22 from the floor. What surprised Coach Wooden and the Bruin fans more than anything was how he missed one. With a victory, UCLA became the first team to fashion two perfect seasons back to back. They had won their seventh straight NCAA championship and were still rolling, but the pressure to blow teams out became immense. It was such excellent basketball at UCLA that naturally the people came to expect it and it got to a point where uh, we just weren't supposed to win a basketball game but we were supposed to win by X number of points and that pressure got to be pretty strong not just from the students and, and the area fans but the media as well. Yeah, there was pressure by the fans like to play well and win big every game but hey, we should have. We had a lot of really good players. In 1974, the streak reached 88, then ended at Notre Dame. Two more losses, then David Thompson in North Carolina State in the NCAA semifinals. Though Bill Walton scored 29 points, North Carolina State beat UCLA 80 to 77 in double overtime. The media finally had a new story to write about. John Wooden said that his biggest attribute as a coach was getting the most out of his players on a consistent basis. Never was that more evident than with the 1975 Brewers. Myers, Washington, Johnson and Company came the closest of any Wooden team to realizing their maximum potential. They won 28 games and many went down to the wire. Against Louisville and Denny Crum in the NCAA semifinals that year, UCLA played in what some consider the best collegiate game ever. Louisville had the Bruins down by four at halftime, but by the end of regulation, the score was deadlocked. With the clock running out in overtime, Richard Washington saved the most important of his 26 points for last. For the second time in four years, UCLA had kept Denny Crum from the finals. We let it slip away at the end. Uh, I, I felt at the time that if we had to lose, I'm glad it was to UCLA and for Coach Wooden, uh, especially since he announced his retirement after that game. The national press wrote of Wooden's timely announcement that it was just a ploy to get his team ready to play Kentucky. Never entered my mind. The only uh, time it ever entered my mind when I read in the paper, probably. Uh, and when I read in the paper, I thought, well, maybe it will do that. But uh, I thought at the same time, if you take something like that, to get a team ready to play a national championship game, there's something wrong with the players. If playing for the national championship isn't enough, I don't think anything of the coaches retiring or, or trying to fire them up in any other way is going to do much good. This would be Wooden's last game on the bench, and the players weren't about to make it a losing venture. They did not want to be remembered as the only team that ever lost a John Wooden UCLA championship game. The Wildcats were formidable, but UCLA's 10th title in 12 years was imminent. It was an incredible span of years as UCLA lost but 22 of 357 games. 
It was an incredible span of years as UCLA won 44 of 45 pressurized NCAA playoff games. Because of one man and one school, college basketball never has and never will be the same. I'm never going to deviate from uh, John Wooden. He's the, he's the god of basketball. The UCLA is special. The Boston Celtics, the New York Yankees. To have had that dominance uh, for that long a period of time is something that, that I don't think will ever happen again. You know, the history stuff, the, you know, that's for sports writers. And no one has done it before or since, and I doubt if anyone ever will. There are other schools that might possibly do what we did, but um, we did it first, and uh, I think... Uh, we will be remembered for it. Be quick, but don't hurry. Balance, mental, physical, emotional. Disagree without being disagreeable. You can't antagonize and influence at the same time. I don't want activity without achievement. Much can be accomplished if you're not worried about who's going to get the credit. Acknowledge a teammate after a score, even if you're surprising. Remember that you can't do anything about what happened yesterday, and you can't affect tomorrow, except by what you're doing right now. Work today. Forget yesterday and tomorrow.